Welcome to the weekly in web browsers and IPFS GUI team sync up. Uh, as is customary, we will be working from an agenda. So let me share that momentarily. Da, 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 da. There's a couple of items on the agenda, moves call time, OKR discussions, but uh, we shall start with a round of show and tell from things you've done last week. Lytle, top of the list, top of the bill. Would you share with us a thing that you did? Don't I forget you are muted. Yeah, there we go. Yep. yep. <laughs> okay, so um, we have not uh, hear each other on this call for two weeks. So <laughs> um, the first week we've been in Lisbon doing uh, hacking and planning, and uh, there's uh, a thread for in web browsers working group uh, with our hopes and dreams for this quarter and those hopes and dreams then had to be uh, cut down significantly to things that we will be able to fit into a quarter but if you are interested in uh, like entire list of hopes and dreams uh, Dietrich published it uh, on this fantastic thread so that's uh, related to OKRs. <laughs> um, had some discussions around ENS collaborations um, on the translation front. Uh, we what, got, what, are, what are ENS collaborations? Yeah, so like uh, nothing solid yet, uh, but we are probing uh, ground on like, taking different uh, stakeholders in ENS ecosystem, so like browser vendors, uh, DApps, uh, uh, some low-level platforms that already introduced ENS uh, support. And uh, th this effort is mostly like uh, tracked by Arkady, but I'm helping him with uh, some technical uh, advisor. For, for yeah. those who don't know, what is ENS? Oh gosh, yeah. So. <laughs> ENS is, uh, maybe I'll share uh, ENS. So ENS is uh, Ethereum uh, naming service, which lets you uh, to publish a pointer to IPFS uh, content ID or something else entirely on the Ethereum uh, blockchain. And some software already shipped support for that. If you install MetaMask, you are able to enter uh, Ethereum domains, which end with .eth, and that will use distributed uh, blockchain uh, service uh, to for, instead of the classical DNS-based resolver and load web page for you. Uh, IPFS Companion does not support that yet, uh, mostly because we don't ship uh, Ethereum clients with it. Uh, but we are looking into ways we could add uh, ENS resolving capability to software that does not ship with a full Ethereum clients. So sort of like delegated ENS resolver. And that's what those uh, conversations are about. It's just the very beginning of uh, uh, hurting all the cats and uh, looking what is the smallest uh, thing we could collaborate together on. Uh, yeah, so that's more or less. Um, moving, moving to like translations, uh, we added support for uh, our Brazilian uh, collaborators uh, who have some specific, like different language than people from Portugal uh, for technical uh, terms and we will be we are in the process of splitting a uh, single local into two separate locals um, added some notes about uh, uh, alternative service header which could enable us to support um, seamless migration path similar to the way HTTP 2 was introduced um, those were sort of boring things that I don't have any visuals, but now I have visual uh, for I, I, 
Yeah, Oli. What, what is alt surf? Alt surf is a HTTP header that yeah. you can use to announce that this uh, specific uh, website service can be loaded using uh, a different transport, uh, which is very cool for web browser support. It's not uh, cool right now because it requires like native support by the vendor itself. We are not able to like make use of this header from our browser extension, but if one of vendors ships support, uh, we that would be like a standard compliant way of uh, introducing migration path. And uh, very cool. Yeah, and like uh, it's already like battle tested for around HTTP two and uh, origin uh, and address and location bar stays the same. So. It's an interesting way. Uh, we should probably uh, look at that uh, eventually. Uh, companion in version uh, 2.8 landed in a stable channel. It includes visual refresh of main menu and preferences screen. Uh, pinning is no longer closing this menu. It's like a lot of small visual tweaks. Uh, still work in progress if you have ideas uh, of like how, how to improve it, there's an issue when you can uh, discuss that. And already there are things that we plan to do next. Uh, context actions are available on the NS link site. So even if you uh, temporarily disable redirect and keep location, uh, original location in location bar, you will get uh, context actions for uh, websites that are backed by IPFS. Uh, we shipped. Uh, well, we shipped, we opened new web UI uh, with Companion, uh, which has very cool improvements on the file screen. So make sure to check that. Uh, you are now able to opt out from redirect for a specific website. So let's say you want to watch something on DTube or, or something like that, but for some reason it does not work, you can re disable redirect only on that one website. And if you are browsing the uh, NSLink website, it will, uh, switch between uh, IPNS path and uh, original domain name. And there's like a separate uh, toggle for disabling redirect globally if you want to test something or just want to use uh, other integrations. Uh, synchronized translations, big thank you to all everyone who contributed translations. And uh, I think that's it. Install it from uh, the store. It's in the, on the stable channel available for Firefox, Chrome, Chromium, Brave, Opera, all the usual suspects. And what else? Oh, right. Uh, I was able to finally find some time to fix embedded uh, JS gateway. So it now produces uh, like a valid streaming responses. Um, I think. I think I've added a, like a longer explanation what was wrong and uh, what are the next steps. But I think I will be able to give you a quick demo. So uh, I got uh, Brave running uh, on my laptop. And you can see there's a JS IPFS node, embedded node running here. And if we like uh, open a local gateway, so 1990 is local gateway exposed by the web extension itself. And this is an image that was loaded from that uh, gateway. It loaded without a problem, uh, which is good. And uh, what is very good is I have also managed to fix a bug in JS APFS, which did not do streaming responses correctly, because like, uh, it was doing uh, streaming, but uh, the HTTP server that we've been using was caching entire payload uh, because it was doing uh, gzip compression, I think. And it did not flash uh, after each chunk. It was like buffering entire thing in memory. And when entire thing was buffered, then it compressed entire thing. So I fixed that. And after now, when it does the streaming after each chunk, it is flashing the compressor. and a streaming response is working currently. So I think I, I probably should be able to show streaming, uh, but I think the even cooler things to show is that now that we have like working gateway, we probably should, 
should be able to just open a web UI using this gateway. Okay, that was, yeah, it worked. <laughs> so this is a, a local gateway uh, exposed by JS IPFS running in the extension itself, uh, which is super, super cool. And you can see I am able to, like I got a file here added before, I can explore stuff and it's just, everything is embedded. Uh, the, the, I need to refresh this UI, but it's, it's a very good that cool yeah that that fix that fixed everything <laughs> yep all right i won't take uh, more time from everybody else but that's right. my demo i have the uh, that's very cool so that's kind of ipfs javascript in the browser binding to ports it's ridiculous yeah it, we have like http server in http browser which is ridiculous <laughs> Very cool. Um, one musing from using uh, Companion, it probably isn't the right place to dig into it too deeply, but there's a kind of UX annoyance, which is like the, the, the idea of just always redirecting to the gateway or always using HTTP is kind of like never what I want. What I want is like, go for, go for the fastest thing possible, like get me the web page. And if it will like, and so if that's HTTP initially, because you have to locate peers and blah, blah, blah. Like I kind of want that like after the fact also get this website into my local IPFS so that then the next time I visit it, it's super fast, like the service worker kind of model so that I can leave the, I can leave the redirect enabled or I can like, I can still get things from my local cache where they're available, but get like not feel the slowdown like i don't ever want to have to turn it off for a particular website because i'm annoyed because it's taking too long and i know that the http one will be faster for the first load does that make sense Remember? yeah yeah like we we could we are detecting dns link on websites right now mm -hmm. so we could sort of like preload them in the background not mm -hmm. sure like it, it's a tricky because some people are using maybe using it on mobile and you are duplicating data. So you got the double mm. transfer, you know? Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> That's not a use case optimized for today. Also, so the way that um, Beaker does it is it's like, you go to the HTTP one and it's like, oh, P2P version is available. And then you kind of opt in to that. Jim, did you have a comment? Yeah, I think um, the stuff that Arakli Gozala is working on is pretty much the, per the whole like, idea per peer-to-peer -peer progressive web app. So mm -hmm. it's like you go, yeah. it's, it's, it shows up HTTP, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it shows up, it appears like a normal website, but it's actually being loaded completely over IPFS. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if you've got that capability, then if you're on a, your phone, doesn't have that capability, it still works somehow. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, but I think we're getting like, with the companion, I mean, like if you got companion installed or if you're running Brave and it's just got it, like mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be like anyone that's got that capability. But yeah, <laughs> right. the stuff that Arakli put together is pretty like iframes and a bunch of sure. service workers. Is it's like, that's a real tangled bunch of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, this so is just to like, figure out, figure out what, what the clean way of doing that is going to be, is going to be a lot of work. Mm. So this is just a proposal for the UX of IPFS companion that might be more pleasing day to day that is like for the first time you hit a site that is also has a DNS link, then don't, don't force that first visit to go via the local gateway. Oh yeah. So th there's a, actually a separate issue about uh, sh if we should read actually redirect DNS link websites to local gateway when we don't have capability to guarantee origin is isolation, but mm -hmm. that's a mouthful way of saying that we don't want to change like the domain name. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel there's a way of making that, like of improving that. Basically, we are able to detect if a request is for the mainframe, which is the page that mm -hmm. has an address in location bar, or is it for any of sub-resources on that page? 
-hmm. So basically for DNS link websites, we could change the default to not redirect that main request and keep the location, but all images, CSS, JavaScript would be loaded from IPFS. The um, second time. The second time. Uh, yeah, so that's a, an open discussion. There's an issue related to that. If anyone is interested, go to IPFS. I think that's a, a good idea. It depends on how you perceive the viability or timeline of delivering subdomain like local HTTP proxying within companion and go IPFS. Like yes. that's, a, that's arguably a better solution. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so the plan uh, my like, it's not very solid, but I think un until we have that uh, HTTP proxy, which creates a very nice domains in location bar, we will probably do what I just mentioned just don't redirect the main uh, request and keep the origin unchanged. Uh, there's a risk of mixing content from different origins. Yeah, it's not as, it's not as clear cut as, as that makes it sound. Yeah, yeah. Challenging, all right. Um, uh, that, was a, that was a tangent, but something that's been rolling around my head. Um, next on the list. <gasps> It's Diogo. Diogo, do you want to share a thing? Yeah, sure. Okay, so hello everyone. Last week we were almost everybody in the team week in Lisbon, so that's that. Then this week I started to dive deep in protoscope, learning a bit of you. So I did a bunch of reworking and restructuring of the project. Basically, our aim is to make it uh, as simple as possible for everyone to add tutorials. And uh, you had to, to put some code in to make everything work. But the way I restructured uh, things, you just have to basically uh, add some routes, because I, I haven't found a, a better way to do that. But I should be able to in the future. But then again, I think it's pretty better. But most of the work is done on this JSON, these tutorials. You just, uh, yeah, I can just show you. It's easier. Right now, we have a bunch of tutorials. In our case, we have three. If you want to, to add another one, you just come to this JSON. Uh, pick a new entry, like bar or something. Just going to and it should automatically appear. Yeah, and everything is right here. So yeah, this is cool because we're uh, hoping that we'll get a bunch of tutorials for IPFS camp and as we make it uh, easier for everyone, it will be easier for us too. So that's, that's the thing. Another thing I did was to, I have to uh, componentize a bunch of stuff here. So every tutorial is now a component and we have now landing pages for each, each of them. So when we, you previously, when you clicked here, you would automatically go to the first lesson. And now we have like this little index landing page for each tutorial. So you can see what lessons are on it. Yeah, this. Uh, this is basically, it's, I would say it's a work in progress, but I think it's one more commit and it's ready to go. So, so yeah. Very cool. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, uh, I'm kind of, I, I put this under blocked, but I am not really blocked. I'm just waiting on some feedback to the, the web UI tours that I, I have been working, uh, but uh, the, ev everything is, is working. I'm just waiting for feedback so we can merge this and maybe release it, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, next up this week, I want to finish the, this Proscope commit and I'll start, start to help Terry in the files tutorial and probably tackle some web UI issues that I, I saw that all in me. So yeah, that's about it for me. Super good. That is good progress on the protocol. 
noise. Um, all right, it's me. I will share a thing. Da, 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 da. No, nothing super visual to share this week, but um, worth discussing is uh, the we came up with the first draft of the hopes and dreams for the GUI team for the next quarter. So if you are interested in what UI endeavors can be done to improve IPFS over the next three months, you should take a look at this issue, 926 on IPFS team management. Um, and it has, uh, has our proposed OKRs, which basically is focused on proto school documentation, onboarding, user experience, um, creating content for IPFS camp, which we hope is mostly valuable to proto school. Um, some improvements to the docs website and ipfs.io website. Um, one that we've been talking about a chunk this week is uh, IPFS desktop being the default installed item. So there was a proposal on for, for the home page. There was a proposal to simplify. R right now, if you click on install on ipfs.io, it takes you to a multi-step process that involves unpacking, like download a tar, unpack a tar, copy a binary into your path, which is basically a kind of unhelpful level of detail for experts and an unhelpful level of detail for beginners. So there's a proposal to say, well, basically, if IPFS is a command line tool, let's let's suggest that you install it from your favorite package manager and make sure that that's up to date so that the install step is one command, not several, and more likely to work. Um, that way, we kind of demonstrate that IPFS is, is uh, you know, has active community support in that it exists on many different package managers. That kind of lends a sense of credibility to a project. Um, but also, the discussion then moved on to, shouldn't we just recommend installing IPFS desktop? So there's another, there's another iteration on this. So then the only caveat, the only thing preventing us saying everyone just install desktop all the time is most of our content is tutorials that involve using the command line. And right now installing desktop doesn't also install the command line tooling. So there is an open issue on desktop to make that the case. And this is our next priority for desktop and in our OKRs. So Lytle and Enrique have been thrashing that one out. Uh, and I just tooted on it today that we should definitely start by copying whatever it is Atom did. So I dug around in that for a bit and uh, yeah, it's kind of neat. Just um, it checks for their existence on first run uh, and copies it to a shell script. I think Lytle has some interesting ideas around not directly linking to the binary, but having an intermediate wrapper shell script that can make sure that your IPFS command line is always pointing to the same binary that desktop is pointing to, which projects forward to a future feature that is desktop should let you configure which version of IPFS you want to use. And that would include toggling between JS or Go implementations, um, which is definitely an advanced feature. It's something that we're all internally interested in, but I think externally we kind of need to be careful about how we promote that because it's a kind of cognitive overhead for the user that perhaps isn't interesting at this stage, or at least needs to be framed in terms of what features it makes available. Anyway, that is a chunk of work that is going on. Um, so check out the OKRs, check out the add to path issue that is going to make installing things a lot nicer. Uh, we just got, we just updated GoIPFS with the latest 2.4.4 web UI release and there's an 0420 Go IPFS release that is going to RC1 in the next, either today or tomorrow. Um, so potentially by the end of the week, uh, the new web UI might see the light of day with, with Go IPFS, which would be great. Um, otherwise, I've been digging into the code of JSCID, the cornerstone of IPFS, CIDs and I'm making breaking changes. So if you care about CIDs in JavaScript land, you might want to look at um, pull request 77 on multi-formats JSCID because the problem that we have is in web UI, we, if we get given a base32 encoded CID, well, what we do is we take the user provided string, 
and we pass it to the CID constructor. So we say new CID, this string. And in the current implementation of CID, it coerces all CIDs. Like if you ask for the string representation back from the CID object, it always gives it to you in base 58 uh, Bitcoin Clover, um, which, which has to change when we move to base 32, but is also, in my opinion, unnecessarily draconian in the sense that CIDs is flexible to the base encoding. So uh, I've added a feature to CID, which means it preserves, if you pass a CID string to the CID object, to CID constructor, it will preserve the base that you gave it. So when you ask for the string format again, it will use the base encoding that you provided. What do I mean? What do I mean by that? Uh, it's easier if I show it. So what I'm proposing is if I give a base32 encoded CID string to the CID library today, um, what I'd like to happen is if I later call two string on it, that I get the same string back. Um, or if I pass a, a base 58 encoded, CID, if I later call two string on it, I get a base 58 encoded version back, um, which seems kind of obvious when you say it like that, but up until now that has not been the case. So um, there's a pull request in flight to fix that. And also to tidy up the constructor of JSCID because it was getting a bit hairy because a few features had been added to it over the years and yeah, need was time to refactor. Anyway, that is what I've been working on. Uh, so next week I'm gonna be for the rest of the week, I'll be focusing on, I've already been looking at adding end-to-end -end tests to uh, desktop because a couple of bugs have surfaced this week that the, the promise of using an Electron app um, is that you get a known version of Chromium. So you have fewer problems with browser bugs because you, you know the browser that you're deploying on. Um, which unfortunately we haven't been testing on that specific version and it's an old version and it has really interesting, unique bugs that Chrome doesn't have, or didn't have at that, that release number, particularly around adding directories of files again. So right now in desktop, depending on how you try and add directories of files, uh, it doesn't work again, which is great. Um, so there's a like we have to stop releasing versions of the GUIs that the core feature of IPFS doesn't work in them. But this this has good tests in Web UI and they all pass. But when you load it up in desktop, it fails because the version of Chromium in Electron has new and unique and interesting interpretations of the get WebKit relative path non-standard feature of when you drop directories on on web pages, so I have to dig into that, but I'm not gonna dig into it until I have a test that tells me that it passes, because it's just getting embarrassing now. Um, and there's another one which I don't, I just don't even understand yet, but the the graph crumb, the in IPLD Explorer, that lets you navigate back up to the graph, so if you drill down and drill down and drill down into an IPLD graph in IPLD Explorer, if you use the breadcrumb in Firefox or Chrome, works fine, always has done. If you use it in Electron, in Chromium, errors out, super cool. Didn't, didn't see that coming. Don't have a test for that. So don't have a test in it. I can run an Electron app and drive it. So yeah, it's been a fun week. Um, what else happened? Oh yeah, we went to this event. I did a good write-up. If you haven't seen it, it's got a couple of photos on. If you have photos of that event, that you want to share, you should definitely set up a account with the what's it, textile. I should set up a textile photos account and share the photos of that with us. Um, otherwise, that's me. Anyone else got things they want to share? Eric's on the list. Great. Eric, you want to go? Sure. Not a whole store of um, IPFSness. Did the Lisbon thing with y'all. And uh, yeah, I'm as a, someone who's split across different projects. Um, Filecoin has been one that's been distracting me, trying to iterate on that brand and give them uh, give them some usable stuff. 
Uh, and in terms of IPFS, I really have nothing GUI wise um, that I've done. I am doing something IPFS wise regarding uh, just designing some thumbnail, um, some, some thumbnails for uh, kind of title cards for videos that we put on YouTube. Um, trying to make some kind of a simple system uh, for uh, for Zach. The, the problem is it, it's essentially like postage stamp design. The idea is to uh, to make things uh, scannable in a way that you can tell what's different about each each of them. Uh, the words are are easy to read or, or at least are readable. Uh, so I'm, I'm making a, I'm sort of gravitating toward a really simple really simple layout that had, that uses maybe some kind of a color coding overall colors IPFS but then it um, uses a, a shard of color to identify you know IDM IPFS GUI etc cetera, etc cetera. so not specifically GUI but um, you know I like, the, uh, I like the direction I saw some previous iterations of that I like the direction it's going and one um, one design challenge to add to the mix that you may have seen already is uh, embedding embedding these videos in other websites. YouTube adds the title of the video over the top of the slide. Mm -hmm. so you, you can see the challenge here. Like <laughs> these are relatively like easy to read, clear slide title screens, but then YouTube has <laughs> has clobbered us by adding adding the name on top. So you, you can configure that. Uh, what we should do on this website is just configure the embed to not embed the title, but it's just worth being aware of. Yeah, because that's essentially what we're covering off on. Mm. Challenges in every direction. And uh, yeah, next I'm planning to dive head first into getting a style guide underway. Um, if tachyons are the way to go, then that might be a good base for it. I'm going to take a look at, uh, to the best of my knowledge, see what, how, you know, to the best of my knowledge about how IPFS stuff works, see whether I think tachyons is a good base, um, flexible and something we might be able to, um, customize without too much, uh, you know, without turning too much of it off. And uh, additionally, then, you know, taking a look at the couple of apps that we do have and breaking them down, doing analysis of things I might uh, iterate on and different components that we might pull out of there. Um, and then make, dropping those into a, into a, web page, just a general outline of what a style guide and component library might look like, just creeping towards something that's clickable and living and useful for y'all. Woo! And we played a little with uh, Bit, Diogo, um, and Chris played a little with Bit, which is a pretty cool component, like an automated component library pulling out our React stuff, and that might be that might be a cool tool. It's re it's it's really. Uh, I, did, did you go already, Diogo? Sorry, you didn't go yet, did you? Or did you? No, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> if you were planning on showing <laughs> that, uh, oh, I don't have that goal because I was making that on the master branch, so I just yeah. set up everything. Yeah, but my yeah. takeaway points from it, uh, every command is pretty similar to Git. And like in 10 minutes, me and Chris, we were able to create a new collection. But we made it private, but it can be public, no problem. We made a new collection, exported some components there. And then in our project, deleted the lo local components and used the ones uh, from, from Git. I think the, the integration is a bit seamless, it's, it's pretty good. The only downside we had, uh, I don't remember. I know I wrote it up here. Loading that, right, loading the whole framework um, uh, for each. You have to load 
loaded like for each component again oh, yeah yeah exactly yeah as, as we're importing it's about the global imports we're importing tachyons uh, globally in our project but in bit bit makes us uh, import it, it doesn't work with with uh, global imports so in each of the components in the collection we have to manually import tachyons and ipfs css although the the founder or whatever of it he said that they're working on a fix so we can uh, do global imports on collections so that's awesome i uh, he he said he'll ping us when that's done i think it's worth taking a look on bit i like it yeah yeah they're pretty responsive yeah they are yeah they found us without us even pinging them so that's good very cool it certainly seems like managing a component library is an orthogonal engineering challenge to pushing forward the D-Web. And if, if Bit does a good job of it, then I'm happy to offload that work on them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anywho, um, cool. Eric, anything else or shall we move on? Um, who's next? You go, Terry. Terry, you want to share a thing? Oh, yeah. So mostly I've been watching Diogo be a rock star and crank out all this work that's just went on my to-do list. But I have done a little. So uh, there are links to the roadmap and Q2OKRs for Proto School dropped in the notes if anybody wants to look at those. I think it was great to be together uh, last week and getting some help on Proto School is gonna be awesome. So the thing that I'm in the middle of, focus more on now and like kind of making progress, kind of just feeling overwhelmed and stuck is this file tutorial, which one of the problems I'm having is that there are two completely separate points of view on what we're teaching in, in what order, because we have MFS commands and then we have all the non MFS commands that you can use with files, just like the add and get. And most people had told me that they thought it made sense to do like, here's DAG API, Here's the non MFS file stuff. And then, he, which is like, this is really how IPFS works. And then, wouldn't it be nice if we could do all of this pretending it's mutable stuff on top of it? Great. Then teach MFS as though MFS is like the last thing you learn. And Michael has been encouraging me to just teach MFS and treat it as like the entry point. You just think of it as real don't necessarily admit in that lesson that it's not, and then later reveal under the covers. Like he sees the DAG thing that's there as being advanced. He sees the, the add and get part of files as being advanced, and we do it in another order. So I have that kind of like, that conflict going on. Two separate sets of commands to kind of teach myself to be able to teach them. And my doc, either my documentation and reading skills are not great, or the documentation is not great, or so come. Some combination. So I'm getting a little stuck as I try to make the code exercises. So this is the one I'm most successful with today, which is specifically like the MFS write command. Um, in a, so this one, so the, the upload thing seems to be working here so we can get files into the browser to work with. And then we're starting with just uh, like putting a brand new file in. And I have this working if you do it correctly and then you can see what you put in. But I have this issue where the way that these success and failure messages are generated, it's like if an error message is generated by the IPFS API, that comes up instead of whatever I've told it to put. So for example, if I forget to put the file name and I just give it a folder, which in my beginner mind, I don't, when someone says path, I don't think of the file name as being included. So I would be the kind of person who would do this. Uh, sorry, I have to reset it to make that work. So if I do this mistakenly, I don't get the error I put in, which would have been, oh look, you forgot to put the file name. Instead I get this, which means nothing to me uh, and if I make a different mistake which is to 
forget to do this create true. So it's just looking to overwrite an existing file. Then I get file does not exist. Not like the destination file you wanted to write to doesn't exist. And also I had to change my files to like zebra to convince myself that this word file didn't mean my word file. Yes, Ollie. Um, I agree. This is a, a big challenge for Proto School because the current implementation of verification of code just just runs your code. It has no doesn't do any introspection of the actual text that you write in the editor. It just executes it and then verifies the response, which makes it currently impossible to say anything useful about the code you wrote because we don't we don't introspect it. So we would have to we would have to look into uh, passing the code and having an expectation of the actual the actual AST, the abstract syntax tree of the code that we were hoping the user would put in, which is definitely achievable, um, but it's totally un, like it's not something that Pro School has looked at yet. So the, 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 the feature that you need to be able to get good error messages uh, is, is a big chunk of work, but worth, worth specking out and doing. Yeah, so when I mentioned this to Michael, I like gave him some screenshots of what was happening. It was like, is there a way around this, like inside Proto School? He said we could do a bunch of work to like hack around it and make our error messages go first or whatever, or do what you're saying. The other thing we could do is if people agree that one of these two error messages I've shown you is just plain old not helpful, we could replace it with something we consider to be helpful in the API. Because this is coming from the API, right? That is also a good point. So that's um, one, like that's one option if people agree. But it's possible that you know some people are seeing this who aren't trying to do the same thing and making the same mistake I am. So like inside Proto School, I'm very confident about what the mistake is. Much more confident about what the specific mistake is they're making. Mm -hmm. So I have like I have built I built validation things. They're just not getting hit. None of my validation is getting hit. It's just not actually submitting and getting to any of my validation. Mm -hmm. So. This is one of the things I'm stuck with. Um, but hey, I made code that passed and made it say it passed. So that is a thing I have done, which makes me feel slightly less bad about this project. Um, and then the other problem that I'm having when I tried to use the add command, and this may be a miscommunication or a misreading of the docs, but when I was doing this with Michael last night and he was trying to help me with both the add one and the right one, so I swear that like two weeks ago when I was mistakenly using, like making the lesson an ad and trying to, without MFS and then trying to verify it using stuff in MFS, which obviously the verification was not working. I had mistakenly written ipfs.files.add and then I thought I just passed in my file object as data and that it, like the verification didn't work but it like gave me back a CID. Right now it doesn't do that. And when I looked at this with Michael, he said, that he doesn't think the add can take a file object, which is a blob. The documentation would suggest that it can't take a blob because it's not listed here. It is listed in the documentation for write. And I asked, Diogo says that you're using add and get for share to ipfs.io. So clearly someone knows how to get a file object in here, but if it's a bunch of work that has to be exposed to the user, that would be bad. Holly? So we, um, we discussed this on our previous call. And okay. In uh, WebUI, we wrap it in a readable stream before passing it to add. It's, it's worth. Is there a way to fix the API so you don't have so I don't have to teach a lesson about wrapping file objects in readable stream? Yeah. Terry, let me just say one thing. Hugo, I'm I hear waiting you. for Hugo, uh, hey, an hour. Hey, Hugo. Oh, sorry. Um, um, when people are screen sharing, we can't see all the faces, so feel oh, free yeah, to unmute yourself. Yeah, feel free to interrupt me. Wow. One of my OKRs is to fix exactly that. Ooh, that would be lovely. Thank you. It will get done. So basically, what's happening right now is just because I made one thing work in MFS and haven't made any things work in this one. I think to make myself feel good, I'm just gonna keep working on MFS for right now. 
and make an MFS lesson, and we can circle back to how we do this later. Yes, Ollie? In terms of priorities, uh, I'm basically in agreement with Michael. Like I think Are you? Okay. MF MFS is a reasonable thing to start with. Okay. And I think the DAG commands are definitely advanced users okay. only. Uh, I would campaign in general for them. Nobody, somebody should have told me that the first thing I was learning was advanced, so I would have felt better about myself. Oh yeah, no, it's advanced. Uh, in, in as much as uh, it's, it's not files, like IPFS files, uh, interplanetary file system, adding, getting files, like that's One the core of it. Um, IPLD is, is great, but I don't think we should <laughs> <laughs> we should present that as like as important as files at this stage. Jim, okay. uh, I, I just want to point out, like I actually think that ipfs.add and ipfs.files.add is like ergonomically wrong, like the actual yeah. API. Like, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's too easy to forget to type dot files, and this you get a, a completely different API method, and yeah. then you, you're going to spend like an hour trying to figure out what. What you this did is, wrong in this is a eight things. Do they yeah. both exist? Because there's no ipfs.files.add in the documentation. Sorry, Ellie. Ah, uh, yeah, this is a well-known UX blunder um, that is waiting for someone to solve. Um, so depending on which library you're talking about, so the HTTP client now has moved the the files is now top level uh, I can I'm not even going to say on the call which is correct because it's changed <laughs> at least twice since I've worked here but the point being this is a known problem and we are looking for heroes to solve it <laughs> Hugo suggests that that's going to be me maybe um, <laughs> it's not currently on my OKRs but it, it's a combination of the of the problem of there's like this mismatch of in, in old original flavor IPFS from way back when, it was focused on add, put a file in, get a CID out, and get, put a CID in, get a file out. That's where it began. And then later on, we were like, we need some kind of human-friendly mapping for CIDs because they're hard to work with. So then you get the MFS, the mutable file system, which is just a view over a bunch of CIDs that lets you give human-friendly file paths, aliases to CIDs. Uh, yeah, and as everyone says, and then moving files around from ipfs.files.xyz to ipfs top level. Oh, yeah, it's a whole thing. The general consensus that we got to was that commands about files should be at the top level, like they shouldn't be namespaced. Commands about everything else should be namespaced because we should make file operations the easiest thing. And no one seems to freak out every time I say that. So we're probably going <laughs> to make that happen. It's always a good sign that you're not on a horrible yeah. path. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering if everything should be in the same namespace. No. <laughs> so what shouldn't be in the same namespace is DAG and object and blah, 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 blah all those other things. Because it is like sort of when you first open up the documentation page and you're just trying to do one specific task, it's like, ah, it's like, there's a lot there. And mm. um, I don't know, might, I don't, it's, a, it's a tough problem to solve. Yeah, I, I would, um, I would extract DAG and object to a separate command. I would make an IPLD command that is something you can install if you want to add data to IPFS. I, th I think the proto school stuff is really helpful because this is really going to yeah. force us to change things. So we have, <laughs> we have, to, we have to. Terry's really, complaining, <laughs> fix it. But, um, well, I think if we really want people to really learn these APIs, like they're going to go to this really high quality place. And if everybody's crashing and burning when they go there, that's probably telling us that our API that like everything a, under the covers is probably fine, but just the way it's uh, organized at the top yeah, level, yeah, yeah. it probably that, needs a little attention. That happened once already with Proto School. So we did Proto School in time for the DWeb Summit, and everyone was like, why do I have to manually unpack CIDs all over the place? This is the worst. 
And so we fixed that. Okay. Anyhow, that's me. We can stop talking about me. No, it's, um, but we're talking about the UX of IPFS in general, that Proto School is at the vanguard of. Yes, I am. The pointy am. end. The, but the thing that we can also have metrics on. Ooh. Which lessons do people freak out on and just quit to delete their browser? Um, anyone else got anything else to want to want to share? Jim, you got a thing you want to do? Uh, just uh, DDC working group. Uh, we did we did our OKRs like everybody else, and uh, just get the information out there. So there's basically three people in DDC right now. So Pedro and Nadine are just going to do IPNS, IPNS only. They're going to make IPNS fast and awesome and multi writer and all sorts of crazy things. Yes, I don't know. <laughs> we'll we'll see how that goes. That seems like a big big job. Um, and then I'm going to be doing everything else. So, um, and uh, I'm going to do lots and lots of little things. So hopefully maybe I can do a little bit of stuff with package managers, a little bit of stuff with uh, uh, collaborations, and then do a little bit of stuff stuff for uh, IPFS camp. So. Super cool. Are you the main point of contact for the DDC team now? Yes, I don't think I'm officially captain or anything. Okay. You know, I'm, I'm I I wrangled the OKRs anyways. Your co-captain. Yeah. <laughs> the work attaches responsibility attaches to those who do the work. Yeah. <laughs> right on. Cool. Three minutes on the clock. Oh, there was a thing on the agenda. Uh oh. Can I talk? Oh, Hugo. Of course. I'm so sorry. You can talk. Keep interrupting. and talk fast. I will. So uh, what I've been doing, uh, Lisbon Team Week, reviewing some for, for log file stuff uh, that never ends, but possibly this is the time. Uh, lots of planning and OKR definitions for the um, web browser working group. Uh, continue the view support debugging of MPLEX and readable stream. Uh, and basically, we just, we're just going to wait for the pull MPLEX to be more John JSAPFS and that will fix the most critical problem on view. Uh, and yeah, and IPNS research, I went through the DDC OKRs and all our documents they have. Uh, the um, RFC from Lars, uh, which is basically uh, IPNS over DNS, which is not the way the DDC working group is going to implement uh, IPNS. Um, and yeah, I put here that I'm locked on the pull and flex the pull request basically to finish or finish part one of my view support to QR. Uh, and yeah, I'll continue my IPNS research. Yes, Ali. Just on the, that's not the way that DDC are going to implement it. Last I heard Adin speak about it, he was requesting some metrics from the package managers working group to suggest, to help them decide what the right solution for this is. Like, um, what are the needs of the package managers? How quick do they need IPNS to be? Oh, so I, don't, I didn't, yeah, Jim, go for it. Okay, um, so I think we should uh, get like like an IPNS tiger team together. So it's not like just Pedro and Nadine are two full-time resources, but like mm -hmm. Hugo should be on that too. For sure. And, and like, um, there's probably like other people that it touches everything. So it's sort of like, I think we should actually be fairly large. Um, so I, I don't think... Um, we have to do the OKRs on the spreadsheet and they have to fit into the particular groups. But I think so for something like IPNS that like spreads across everything, I think we need to um, figure out how to get people to meet together. So, um, yeah, I already, I already talked with, uh, with uh, Pedro a little bit and he's talked with, with Adim. Uh, and yeah, m my work is uh, more scoped uh, to the browser context. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we need to talk uh, with everyone and see uh, what we're supposed to do because uh, from what the OKRs is kind of 
yeah, I would rather rather implement uh, IPNS over DNS mm -hmm. than doing flood sub with pinners, really. But yeah, we should talk. Yeah, I mean, I've I've sort of talked to uh, Dean a little bit about like how resolution happens so fast in that protocol so on that project, and uh, you know it's basically the same thing. So. Uh, Jim, would you be happy to bubble this up to the project project call? Yeah, I'll do that. So. And and just double check with uh, Pedro and Adin that they're happy to be tigered up. <laughs> yeah, I think it's I a good idea. And it's a good suggestion. You just need to raise it with with project level. Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, it's just it's just going to be like decide like if do you want to do video meetings or work asynchronously? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, perfect. Anybody, anybody got anything else they want to share? We're one minute over, so no is a good answer. Um, there's a thing in the agenda that says, this call has moved back an hour for many people whose time zones have shifted relative to UTC. Is that a problem? Anyone, has this call seemed to be healthy? There's no, there's no Dietrich, but I assume he's, that's not because of not because of time zones. Diogo's toler tolerating it with a 50-50. Hugo still looks happy. All right. I'd be happy to push back to the hour we had it at, but this is not impossible. No, it's just a matter of when I I'm feed not. myself. No, it's all good. I, I would elect to keep it locked to UTC and just deal with it. And then and then in the same way, like we should fix the API. Like we should fix our individual countries sluicing around relative to UTC. Yeah, I have a lot of control over my government, as you can tell, so that'll be no problem. All right. Oh, well, we should have a chat offline because there's some other things I think we should get fixed. Apparently, the whole West Coast of US and Canada are going to switch, so. I think Portugal is was talking about it. Yeah, in two years' time. Two years' time. time. Nice. Um, so Europe has kind of said, we're going to stop dictating whether we should all do it or not, which is just going to be chaos because it's like we should either all not do it or we should all do it. But now it's going to be like every country should just decide. And I'm like, oh God. Or just, or just leave Europe, right? <laughs> and on that note, okay, oh, mic drop. Let's uh, all go and have a nice evening. <laughs> Thanks, Hugo. <laughs> Bye. This has been the IPFS Weekly in Web Browsers and GUI Team Sync Call and Protoscore and DDC. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Yeah.